are interesting experiments, uh, a little bit darker. Um, and one of the fascinations was that uh, when these experiments were first done, it was not too much uh, uh, after uh, World War II when the, uh, many of the Nazi war criminals were on trial. And we know all the horrific things that uh, many of the Nazi uh, uh, did to various people in concentration camps. And the big question on any, everyone's mind was, how could human beings do this sort of thing to other human beings? And in many cases, uh, the, the Nazi war criminals uh, were not particularly high ranking. They would be ordinary low level or middle level functionaries. And their defense was as well, I was just following orders. I was just doing what I was told to do. And so one of the fascinating parallels then is, well, uh, if, if ordinary American kids under controlled uh, circumstances are willing to do uh, similar things, then uh, how do we uh, interpret the Nazis and what does this say about the human condition? And that's the question. What is it about the human psychology? What's going on in these cases here such that these students are willing to do this sort of circumstance? If you had taken them out of this circumstance, you just approached them at the mall and said, hey, do you think that you know, if someone doesn't know who the author of Moby Dick is, that that person should be uh, punished by having electrical current run through their body? They're gonna say, of course not, that's sick. I would never do anything like that. But put them in this experimental setup and the vast majority of them will do exactly that. And so the reason seems to be that they are being obedient. And in this case, obedience uh, involves for them a suspension of their own judgment Right? One reading of this is to say, well, I'm just a student here, here's the authority figure here. Uh, in this circumstance, I don't need to think for myself. I can just depend on the, the authority figure to do my thinking for me. Or it might, of course, be that, you know, I'm uneasy with this. And some of them, uh, students uh, did seem to exhibit some stress over this sort of circumstance. But I'm still going to head and do so. Uh, and again, it's a kind of cowardice. I don't want to have to challenge the authority figure. And of course, challenging authority figures, when authority figures are doing things that you think are wrong or asking you to do things that are wrong, that's a difficult thing to do. That does take a certain amount of courage. Uh, so what we then have is a psychological predisposition or psychological pressure that many or most of our students uh, are, are going to feel uh, 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 themselves about their ability to make their own judgments about what the right thing to do or what the truth is in a particular circumstance and uh, how they're going to relate to us and to other authority figures uh, if they disagree with our interpretation of the truth or what we were asking them to do in a particular case. So once again, the implication for us as teachers is if we don't want to raise uh, uh, students who make a habit of dependence of this and cowardice, we want them to have the opposite traits. Yes, when they are younger, they are dependent upon us for all sorts of things, but we want them to grow out of that and to become fully independent, particularly cognitively independent. How do we cultivate that independence given that we know that they are going to be susceptible to uh, 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 inappropriate kinds of dependence uh, because uh, they, uh, they, they may have been encouraged to be obedient right, in various ways. And if we uh, don't want them to be cowards, right, intellectually speaking, we want them to have the courage to speak their own mind, to draw their own lines, to say no when they think it's appropriate to say no. How do we, even when we are the authority figures, cultivate in them and encourage, right, the, the courage for them to speak their own minds, to challenge us, hopefully, hopefully rather in a civil and, and productive fashion, uh, so that they learn that it's fine for them to develop their own independence and their, their own courage. All right, so, summing up then, uh, our epistemological task, right, as teachers is very complicated, right? We have a very complicated mind, it takes a lot of effort over a long period of time to learn how to use it, to learn how to use it well, to learn how to use it at an adult level and hopefully at a proficient right, adult level. Lots of skills that we need to be able to parse out, attend to and fold explicitly into our, our lesson plans over the course of a whole academic year and have those integrated with the whole rest of the student's educational program and at the same time various traits of thinking, uh, virtues of training uh, of thinking as I have been calling them. The, the perseverance, the commitment to objectivity, the creativity, and the independence and courage uh, uh, that is going to, that is absolutely necessary 
for us to have proficient adult thinkers. That's our epistemological task uh, and our mission as educators.